Here's what film noir is to me. It's a righteous, generically American film movement that went from 1945 to 1958 and exposited one great theme, and that theme is your f You have just met a woman, you are inches away from the greatest sex of your life, but within six weeks of meeting the woman, you will be framed for a crime you did not commit, and you will end up in the gas chamber. And as they strap you in and you're about to breathe the cyanide fumes, you'll be grateful for the few weeks you had with her and grateful for your own death. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I, I didn't know anything except how much I hated. But I didn't take anything. I didn't, Jenny. Don't you believe me? Baby, I don't care. <laughs> In noir, people go to jail, good men die, criminals win, uh, evil triumphs over good. You could almost say that film noir is, is the, the son of is German expressionism and American tough guys. The pure genre is very, very gut-wrenching, appealing to your own kind of doubts and uncertainties. It's late night stuff. I can't figure it. What do you see in a guy like me? I see a guy who's swell. Who's kind and strong. That's what I see. There's a certain naivete. The characters are very clear what they want, and we always know that most of them will fail. Oh, it's gonna be all right, Bill. You wait and see. Julie. I won tonight. I won. Down these mean streets, lurks, and so on. <laughs> That's noir. I'm gonna go home and go to bed where I can't get into trouble. You think not? I'll see you all of a sudden, Sammy. People confuse um, crime stories and, and, and noir. Well, the biggest difference I see is crime fiction tends to be realistic. It tends to be in the here and now, and it tends to strive to shock you with just how gritty and real it is. I find crime stories tend to be very literal, often quite boring, generally rather ugly to look at. Whereas noir is gorgeous, it's all style, but it's the emotional realism is what you're after. It's not that you're divorcing yourself from reality, it's just you're saying reality is my clay. Don't come in. These are crime films, you know, they fall under the large umbrella of crime films. But certainly the type of subject matter that distinguishes film noir is this idea of total moral ambiguity that is inaugurated in the Maltese Falcon. It's the sense that the hero is not necessarily grounded in any sense of right or, or wrong, and a large part of that has to do with the sense that the whole world is also one of radical instability. We didn't exactly believe your story, Mr. Shaughnessy. We believed you $200. You mean that... I mean you paid us more than if you'd been telling us the truth and enough more to make it all right. There is a real political streak in these movies because in the 1930s when Warner Brothers was cranking out gangster pictures they were lessons to the public by like, crime does not pay then noir came along after the war and complicated things because you were asked to empathize and identify with those criminals in a way that wasn't really allowed in the 1930s because of the situation at the end of World War II the themes of these movies tend to be dark cynical and pessimistic about human nature Film noir, unlike other film, feels no responsibility to reflect some sort of cinematic morality. Film noir just is. It doesn't talk down to you. Uh, it doesn't condescend to you. It, it says to you, this is the way the world is, and this is the way the world is going to come out, and we're not going to pretend that cinema has all of the answers. Aren't you in this deep enough? If you help them, wouldn't it make it worse for you? That's the way it's got to be. I can tell you I know it when I see it, but I don't know how to define it. Almost every element that you name 
as the definition of a noir film would apply to Casablanca, but you would not call Casablanca a noir film. Go ahead and shoot. You'll be doing me a favor. Film noir is a very elusive thing to define. It's trench coats, it's intrigue, it's cigarettes, it's the lying between men about a woman, it's hidden motives, it's the psychological turning over of characters. It's, I think it's a very elusive genre. You take some horrible sort of satisfaction in seeing people torn apart. They're headed for it anyway. You're headed for it. You're hanging on to something, it's gonna smack you. If I fold now, it smacks you later. If I stick, it smacks you sooner, but cleaner. Maybe that's why I'm sticking. Film noir is not a genre, it's a style. It crosses many genres. I know there are people that think that you can have a Western that's a noir. <laughs> or a war picture that's a noir. Generally, I tend to think that it's a crime thriller. What designates a film as noir is when the writer and the director tell the story from the criminal's point of view. The audience is made to identify with the criminals. The way I figure my luck's just got to turn. One of these days I'll make a real killing, then I'm going to hit for home. First thing I do when I get there, I take a bath in the creek and get the city dirt off me. That to me is a major distinction. A picture like and On Dangerous Ground is a noir because Robert Ryan plays this cop who really has a psychotic streak in him and it's told through his eyes and that's a noir. For me, film noir is a historical movement in the history of film. It began in earnest after World War II, it started to decline with the advent of television and by the end of the 50s it was over. You're stubborn, but you're not afraid. You're an ex-con with a new beef around your neck, and I can hang you with it. Hang me, then. One job like that, and I'm your pet rat for the rest of my life. Film noir is not a genre, but it is, in fact, a, a kind of, of, of tone poem for film. The visual tone as well as the psychology of the film. If you look at a film noir that's more or less typical, uh, we could even use the Maltese Falcon. It has a certain world that has been established and created by the filmmakers, where the style and the content are very close together. In the sense, it represents a world of extremes, of shadows, of extremes in, in emotion, working in the sort of the seamy underbelly of San Francisco life. And the world is his world. He inhabits it, we inhabit it, and everything about it has to do with the tone and the style of the film being completely meshed into one. A genre, like a western, a gangster, a space exploration kind of sci-fi film, zombie film. These genres will exist in perpetuity and they will always be reformulated. Now, at one point they were being made in the film noir way. Film noir is a language which is deep shadows, strong angles, behavior over dialogue. And as a language, that vocabulary can be used in a film in which its whole world is made up of those stylistic elements. But it can also be used as tools to create film noir of science fiction, like Blade Runner, which to me is very much a, a film noir um, piece. Endless debate about the first film noir. What is it? Fritz Lang's M, made in 1931, not made in America, but made in Germany, gets a lot of votes. I won't argue the point, but in the United States, there are several films. There's a small film made at RKO in 1940 called The Stranger on the Third Floor that really has all the hallmarks of noir, the visual look, the art direction, the cinematography, what the story is about. It's complete, self-contained noir. There it is. He said himself he'd kill Nicky when he had a gun. When you look at the, the narrative elements that really define the genre, I think Detour is possibly not the earliest, but it's the most stripped down B-movie film noir I'm aware of which I think is actually in a lot of ways more interesting than the big polished studio version of it that, that Citizen Kane was, however you know, brilliant that was and it's a great favorite of mine. There are some films even in the 30s that people have said are film noir because they're very dark gangster films. A lot of people think Double Indemnity is the first film noir 
And many people think that it didn't happen until murder my sweet. The papers didn't say much, except that he wasn't shot. How? With a sap. On a good. If an elephant had stepped on his head, same effect. For me, it's, it's a style of the 40s, a most interesting style, because it introduces more complexity, more ambiguity into American cinema. It introduces characters who are not all good or bad. People who use pretty faces like you use yours don't live very long anyway. How do you think I should use my face? You're rolling your own dice, kid. It had a lot to do with things held over from the Depression because so many of the stories were based on the works of writers who were writing at the peak of their powers during the Great Depression. And that's when you had Hammett and James M. Cain and W.R. Burnett started writing these crime pictures and Raymond Chandler started writing and Cornell Woolrich. And there was a huge wave of these movies. I, I call it the Black Tide that washed over Hollywood in the post-World War II years. And it was indicative, I think, of America's loss of innocence. What do you really think of me? You impress me as a man who needs a new suit of clothes or a new love affair. But he doesn't know which. Screenwriters were determined to paint almost an anti-myth. If Hollywood in the Depression was selling the idea of, don't worry about it, you know, we'll get out of it, and we're eternally optimistic, now that World War II had passed and we'd all seen just how bad it could really get, they were saying, hey, you know, it's time to grow up and that happily ever after thing is an abomination in a way. And so they created what essentially was an anti-myth in these crime dramas, you know, that the world is at heart a really nasty, dark, ugly place. And finally, I guess, American audiences were ready to accept that. Sounds like a soul in hell. I think World War II changed how we saw movies in many ways. Bogart could not have been a hero before World War II. The country was really more sophisticated and willing to accept a different kind of reality than they had before the war. Everyone grew up in World War II, and there was everything from existentialism to film noir that would really say there was a dark side out there. Now we start looking at each other again. We don't know what we're supposed to do. We don't know what's supposed to happen. We're too used to fighting. But we just don't know what to fight. Between the end of World War II and the atomic age and the threat of annihilation, suddenly you're looking at a world that is not comfortable in any way. You fought the great battle for democracy and you've won and yet death is hanging over you. Keely, what's happened? Has everything suddenly gone crazy? I don't mean just this, I mean everything. Or is it just me? No, it's not just you. The snakes are loose. Anybody can get them. I get them myself. They're friends of mine. We culturally, pop culturally, we always look for a metaphor. The same way that the Soviet threat was turned into, into aliens and spaceships and, and flying saucers. The frustration of returning soldiers coming back thinking they'd created a utopia and finding out it was still the same crappy old world translated into this entire genre of a chaotic world that had to be redressed by these lonely men who would sort things out. With World War II, the country was very reluctant to get into the war, uh, as are most of the heroes in film noir. They know that they're getting involved in something bad, but they have to do it for whatever reason. They're compelled into it, and once there, they learn that no matter how much they thought they had control over the situation, they don't. And that everything ended badly, even if you won. It's just a kid. Yeah, that's what I said once. Maybe you'll be lucky. Maybe they won't send him back to prison. Maybe he'll get himself killed first. There is a definite ratcheting up of screen violence in the American cinema of the 40s. Filmmakers and writers and cameramen learning how to negotiate the production code. At this point, it's been refined to a sort of fine art. So we do have scenes of strange sadism and cruelty, which are really quite extraordinary. I've never spoken to anybody who was involved in the production of one of these films in the original noir era who knew that what they were doing was film noir. They laugh when you tell that to them now. We didn't know it was film noir. I was just shooting a picture with a mood that I thought it needed and, uh, and also would give me time to work with the actors and less time for lighting and more time for, for working with the people so that I could get better work out of them. And it worked beautifully and thank God it caught on. 
sorry, I've already got a fair. You sure have two of them. Yes, sir. During World War II, all of the Hollywood studio films that sort of defined this new style of filmmaking were embargoed and they didn't see them in France. So there was a big retrospective of American movies in Paris in 1946. And they sort of noticed a shift, a sort of uh, seismic shift in, in American movies where they suddenly became much darker, where they, the themes were darker, where the look of the film was darker. There was shadowy lighting, chiaroscuro lighting, there was um, violence, much more violence than there had ever been. Um, psychology, Freudianism, existentialism, all these things were in these movies and they were shocked to see all this and so they began to write about it. And they described it as film noir, literally black film. But the French were actually very amenable to this stuff before then because they were doing it themselves. French poetic realism, the films that Jean Gabin made and Marcel Carnier were all very much leading up to this and there was a whole series of novels released in France from the late 1930s, the Cire Noir, uh, which speaks to that idea that there is a noir content, the type of story you're telling, and a noir style, the way you're telling the story. I'll take those for you. Great themes of film noir, institutional corruption, sexual obsession, and lives in great psychological duress. You take those three elements, man, you can turn out a good crime story. Lieutenant! Lieutenant! That, uh, that guy you saw in my office, he's just passing through. Shut up. I didn't see anybody. How could I? I wasn't here. What often drives a film noir is a crime. And I think more importantly, a lot of times, it's the aftermath of the crime. It's the perfect heist that goes wrong. A gun fires of its own accord and a man is shot. And a broken down old harness for no good for anything but chasing kids has to trip over us. Blind accident. What can you do against blind accident? It's seeing how people unravel under pressure. And a lot of what film noir is arises out of the aftermath of that crime. Dix. Dix, isn't he the one with the reward on him? Mind your own business. It's usually involved with some kind of crime or some kind of disorder. And usually film noir doesn't say there's any solution to these problems. And treats these uh, forms of corruption as traps that the heroes or the protagonists get caught up in. You know, paraphrasing Alfred Hitchcock, and when, when he was talking about melodrama, he said that it was reality with all the boring parts taken out. Film noir is us are basic, sexual, greedy, honorable, and evil natures. All right, Lacey, get up. Slob, you. I think, for me, film noir is best defined really by the idea of character being defined through action. You have a set of characters engaged in a complex story, and you are not able to judge these characters until the end, and then you have to assess them through their actions, through the who did what to whom. So that's the tension in noir. We're not always sure who is the bad guy or the bad lady. No, I'm going to pick up a cab. I swear we'll share one. I'm afraid not. We go in different directions. That's where you're wrong. We're going in the same direction, you and I. What could be more noir than the anticipation of the ultimate denouement, which is death? The traditional noir ending is often grim, isn't it? It's the, the bleeding to death in the gutter, which is inherited from the gangster film. You know, I mean, the, you know, the Fred McMurray dropping dead in the office at the end of Double Indemnity. That's how a proper noir ending is, or even just the trap closing in, the police arriving and taking away the regular guy who's been tempted into crime. If you take him in, I'll book this guy myself. One of the rules of film noir, one of the unspoken rules, is the, uh, the last line of the film, that the film really is playing until its very last line. The killing defines film noir in its last two lines. The woman turns to Sterling Hayden, the police are coming, he knows he's screwed, and she says, Johnny, you've got to run. And he just says, uh, what's the difference? And his delivery, the, the, the way in which he delivers it and then walks into the arms of the policeman is so fantastic. It's probably the most brutal vision of noir. It's the idea of, yeah, yeah, life is nasty, brutish, and short. Yeah, but also cheap. Ah! 
The biggest challenge facing the writers of these scripts was that they had to work within the limits of the production code. So they had to figure out very subtle ways of conveying all this sexuality and greed and lust and all this illicit stuff. We ought to get along fine. I'm a gambler myself. Oh? How high do you like to play? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. You will find in these films tremendous sexual symbolism. Uh, cigarettes are used in many ways that you didn't really understand. Oh, yeah, that's what the cigarette actually represents. You know, trains into tunnels and all those kind of things. Sexuality in film noir, it permeates the whole movie from start to finish, either through the music, but certainly through the, the innuendo and the dialogue. I need a drink. What do you need, Mr. Doyle? Well, let's say a drink. Film noir movies are often very sexual, um, but they're sexual in a much more dark, violent, animalistic way, rather than anything that might be called love. It's kind of exciting and attractive. Who's attractive? Who's exciting? Earl! The thing that's great about noir is that this collaboration between the writers and the directors and the actors really created a tone for these pictures and there was no way the production code could fight that. There's those ways of creating a sexual tension that has actually nothing to do with a kiss, a hug, an embrace, but more between what could be and is not quite going to happen. For another nickel we can have a rumble. No thanks, save your money. Hard times are coming. It's 1945 to 1958. Sexuality has not been bandied about, dissected, discarded, reinvented, demythologized, re-remythologized and deconstructed the way it has 50 and 60 years later. It still had some panache. It was something that people didn't talk about openly but did fervently behind closed doors, but in somewhat less volume than today. So it had the odd power of the illicit. And I will only close with this about sex, the great joke of the 1950s. I want to find the guy who invented sex and ask him what he's working on now. I think the film noir filmmakers were really filmmakers for B-films. And if you look back at the history of Hollywood, in the 40s and 50s, huge numbers of films were being made. And they were made either with large budgets, A-category films, or small budgets, and those were the B-films. I think young filmmakers then, that's how they learned to make movies. They were shuttled into the low-budget films, and they were given pretty much free reign because they were made under the radar completely. But these films were largely made to fill the lower part of a double bill in order to have a long evening's entertainment at the theater. So they were, in a strange way, a creation of the distribution system in America. That a lot of these films were made by immigrants who came from Europe. And I'm thinking of people like Fritz Lang, who, at the height of Ufa in Germany, pioneered a lot of the techniques of film noir. Also, Billy Wilder came from this same sort of cooking school of Ufa, so to speak, and brought all the ingredients to America and used them freely. Things like the, uh, the American horror film, I think, was a big influence on, on film noir. I think, for instance, it's, it's a shame that Val Luton's movies are never considered as noir because basically they get very early in the cycle and do things. You think, I mean, something like The Seventh Victim, even Cat People, is a very film noir look movie. I mean, and, and, you know, Jacques Tourneau goes from the Luton films to making out of the past, which, if you have to pick one film noir, that's it. That's got every, every possible aspect of noir is in that picture. It was a very complex phenomenon, uh, noir, the style. It had antecedents in German expressionistic film between 1919 and 1938. That laid out the formal systems for film noir lighting schemes, staging, as well as subject matter because German expressionistic film was dealing with men who were coming apart, human beings who were coming apart. A lot of the people who were, who were the technicians of film noir, directors, cinematographers, were out of Germany. And so they were very influenced by that movement in the 1920s. The house style that was devised at Warner Brothers from the entrance of Michael Curtiz in the late 20s 
a Hungarian Jew who was trained in Norway film industry, and Norway film industry really was the forerunner of German Expressionism, so he knew German Expressionism through and through. He brought this style to Warner Brothers, and it was complemented by the visual designer there, Anton Grot, again, uh, Eastern European, who knew German Expressionism through and through. And so you take a look at these classic gangster films and classic G-Men films at Warner Brothers. It's a dry run for noir. Ah, uh, no, it's all right. What's the difference? I've seen everything. Film noir is a wonderful genre for cinematographers simply because we can create a light that behaves like its own character. When I think of noir, I always think of diagonals. Things not being level, not being straight, because nothing is quite on the level. Nothing is what it seems. There's just a, a very menacing mood that camera angles are askew. You're never quite sure of where you're at in this world shoot up, shoot down. It's a way of t attacking space because harmonic space is your enemy because harmonic space represents a secure world and you are in an insecure world. In your classic noir movie, the camera's used in two different ways. It has to express not just what's happening in a scene, but it has to express the psychological depth or problems of the characters in the scene itself. It's telling the story, but it's also presenting a stylized viewpoint of abstract concepts. So a lot of the great moments in film noir are not looking straight at somebody, but from a weird position that, as an audience, makes you feel a little uncomfortable, a little nervous, a little tension. Is that the patrol? It's the wind and the telephone wires over in the highway. Relativity is important to me, going from light to dark, dark to light. And film noir is, is I find it fascinating when I watch it. I've always considered it this kind of stark graphic lighting. There are a lot of graphics in the lighting. I've always felt it's what you don't see that's, that's kind of disturbing. So you don't quite know what's going on. Not seeing the face is fascinating too. Seeing that little bit of, of shimmer on skin or the way the hat is against the blinds, you know. It's a more mythic way of dealing with light and dark, good and evil. So you have to have rain, you have to have smoke, you have to have dark shadows, you have to have maybe moving light, you have to have some kind of a light pattern that the characters walk through. So maybe it's a fence, maybe it's a, a window pattern, maybe it's a shadow of a tree, maybe it's tree branches. So that's the visual language that we work with when we do film noir. And I still feel that the black and white noirs are the best. In color film, the lighting has never been able to achieve the degree of precision that you see even in Hollywood B-movies. One more job. No. One more job, a big one. No, I, I, I'm afraid. The originality of film noir is you had these technicians from Germany who loved to split everything into shadows and fracture light. The latter with Betty Davis is a beautiful example of film with the German kind of lighting in it. Then you had the post-war movement of getting out of the studio and shooting in the streets. A lot of the technology which freed the film noir was actually pioneered during the war. High-speed lenses, fast film, the mag stock for sound, which liberated the camera so that you could actually take it on the street. Lightweight cameras came into existence, hence the handheld camera. And so they were out in the streets shooting films that were being shot in 10 days and still trying to use that kind of lighting and it made for a very uh, original and fresh world. In Nicholas Ray's They Live By Night, it's famous because it was the, actually the first film to actually use a helicopter shot to open the picture. And that sort of innovative camera technique Nicholas Ray continued to use throughout the film uh, very daring stuff, putting the camera in the back of the car, things from Farley Granger's perspective. It, it's brilliant. I mean, Nicholas Ray directed that picture like it was not only the first movie he was going to direct, but the last movie he was going to direct. We move fast. Can you take it? Me? You. Sure. I can rip myself up to anything. You see it in a lot of noir films where all of a sudden the camera assumes the perspective of the protagonist. And it's a wonderful little gimmick 
for making the audience empathize. And the most extreme example being Robert Montgomery's decision to shoot all of the Lady in the Lake from Philip Marlowe's perspective. Not that Marlowe is a heavy in that film or a true noir protagonist, but I mean that is a pretty daring thing to do. Please don't be so difficult to get along with. I need help. Like I need four thumbs. You never saw the actor who played the lead except in the mirror. You only saw what he saw, which was me. That was what was so unusual about it. The setting of where they happen is very important, usually urban um, settings. That world has to become part of the film noir world, the, the Tenderloin District or the Police Precinct District or the seedy, strange places that you go to to investigate a crime. It becomes this very precise and contained film noir world. You know, you don't see kids in film noir movies. You don't see a lot of normal things. There is that whole sense of um, the whirlpool, the kind of a Freudian sense of being sucked down and being lost in the primal mystery. What's the big idea? Being trapped is essential to the whole noir ethos. You've done something and now you can't get out of it. Even if it's something that takes place in the great outdoors, invariably the film will be photographed and edited in such a way that the protagonist feels completely trapped. I wanted her to smile, but she wouldn't. I tried to make her smile. A lot of the locations and the types of environments that you're shooting film noirs in tend to be those which are closing in on the character as opposed to opening up. You don't find a lot of film noirs in the desert. These films didn't cost a great deal of money. There wasn't a great deal of time to shoot them. And as a result, you tended to minimize setups. And that's why you have a character in the extreme foreground and a character in the extreme background both facing the camera. That way you could fit them both in the frame in a stylized and interesting manner and shoot the entire scene in one setup. I think it might come as a surprise to a lot of people to realize that the producers and directors of these films were being so creative visually to hide the fact that they had no budgets at all and the production values were terrible. So it's like, yeah, let's cast a shadow over there because otherwise it's just an empty hole. There's nothing to look at. What could we do to get the attention of the executives to show them that we had the talent? The only thing we could do was work in, in setups and in, in camera techniques and camera lighting because that didn't take any time. Actually, the lighting we developed, which became later known as film noir lighting, took far less time than, than classical lighting. So, you know, you work fast like that, you, you kind of make things up and use techniques like the things that were created by a cameraman like John Alton and stuff were done through necessity. I think sometimes darkness is, is more beautiful than light. I think everybody has a certain sense, although they're not conscious of it, of how things change in the dark. And the greatest thing in the world happened at night. The good and the bad happens at night. The murders and the marriages, and the love scenes, all at night. I don't know where the influence came from. I sometimes think it came from the street photographers that were, that were starting to capture sort of life on the streets in the big cities, and that, that filmmakers then sort of used, and they were influenced by that to go out and, and film on location, and film at night on streets in rain and cars. All those elements make the viewers respond to the story on an instinctual level rather than intellectual level. The, the visual style is a little bit more instinctual. Well, the environment of film noir is the urban world. In mid 20th century America, it is the depiction of this dark, seductive fantasy world that draws people to these movies above and beyond everything else. It's almost like a fever dream of that world. The editing in a film noir doesn't have to edit as fast as a lot of other genres and that's good because it gives you time to, to sit in this mood and to be a little unsettled by all the elements, editing being a big one of them. Editing in noir is amazing because uh, the stories are so complex sometimes that just keeping track of things can be a challenge. So in addition to the standard editing devices, uh, you know, and you'll, you'll see in noir uh, kind of jumpy editing sometimes used as a substitute for violence because there, there really isn't a lot of violence shown in these movies. People get the mistaken impression that somehow these are 
films with a lot of action, a lot of gunplay, and they really aren't. They're psychological dramas. And the editing sometimes plays, plays a large part in that, establishing a violence that they couldn't actually show on the screen at this time. I think the, the non-linear aspect of storytelling in film noir is one of the reasons that I love the genre. Greater narrative freedoms were allowed the filmmakers. There was an expectation of peculiar points of view, whether it's a, a dead man narrating the film as in Sunset Boulevard or, or even if you look at some of the Val Luton films. These films have always been free to adopt very peculiar narrative devices in order to play with audience expectation. Frankie was kidding himself. He was through. And when he went, the money would go with him. Voiceover is a, an editorial tool that comes from writing, essentially, where the first person starts to tell his story, telling you what fate has brought him. You've got to watch them. You've got to watch them all the time, because things happen when you least expect them. The characters are so hard-bitten, so I think sometimes filmmakers add a voiceover to try to give the audience an in into the character, and, and a voiceover is always the character in the movie speaking directly to the audience. My feet hurt, and my mind felt like a plumber's handkerchief. The office bottle hadn't sparked me up, so I'd taken out my little black book and decided to go grouse hunting. The style of that voiceover. Uh, I think is one of the things that's really characterized the attitude of the films, the way in which the voiceover is delivered, the sort of laconic quality to it, the sort of Raymond Chandler feel of things, I think, is one of the key defining elements of the genre. That old black pit opened up again, right on schedule. I didn't expect to hit bottom. That's all I know. On account I don't see so well with my eyeballs scorched. Then there's another more subtle thing about the editing in these films that I don't think gets discussed enough, which is that the films are really very seductive as well. And they kind of draw you in through this flashback structure very often, where it's a more spellbinding way of cutting a film, and it almost gets dreamy. But I remember looking up and seeing this girl, Jenny. Noir didn't invent flashbacks but noir perfected flashbacks as, as complex and intricate as they could possibly be. In Out of the Past it's used when Robert Mincham is trying to explain his past life to his girlfriend. It was the bottom of the barrel and I scraped it but I didn't care. I had her. You'll actually see the character speaking. His voice continues and we go back in time and essentially illustrate what he's saying. That technique is used a lot. Four hundred thousand dollars. Only, before he could take it, he had to kill the driver. Frankie was in jail now. I think that music in noir plays a much more important role than in other genres. In noir, the music has to be another character. It's sort of this unseen presence that I think can create a mood or remind the audience that we may be seeing something on screen, but there's something else going on. Noir has a very special relationship with music. There are as many different ways of scoring film noir almost as there are film noir movies. There's a lot of interesting layers in film noir scoring, which is the rain, the darkness, the loneliness, the fear of something unspecified. There's always a ticking clock aspect to these films. There's sort of a 24-hour period or a week at the most, probably, and then, you know, these events have to happen. So the music has to highlight the ticking clock aspect of it. That's what's interesting, is that you're always trying to throw an audience's expectations in different directions. To play those ambiguities, you're never quite sure what anybody's motivation is. You're never quite sure where the evidence is leading. I want to go back to Mexico. I'm going to walk out of the sun again and find you waiting. I want to sit in the same moonlight and tell you all the things I never told you. Until you don't hate me. If it's a love story, the love theme also has to have a sadness and an unresolved quality to it. The heroine or the, the hero might die. So we're never quite sure, you know, what is going to be the end result. We have to be very careful that uh, 
you know, there's nothing sentimental about a film noir score. I think film noir, in the way it was stylized, helped or it could help accentuate the sexuality in film. The music could be very seductive, and seductive at this time in more of a manipulative way, as opposed to just pretty woman walking through the scene. There's something dark going on, but seductive, and I think that's the delicious part of film noir, is that they could go a little further with something like music. There are some fabulous composers. But as much as noir endeavored to create this whole new style of storytelling and this new look, a lot of times the scores were kind of stuck in a very traditional string-heavy arrangement, which is really bizarre because most people, when they think of film noir, they will say, oh yeah, all those jazz soundtracks and the saxophone and all that, but it's really not there. I mean, it's really strings, but it's really fascinating in the public consciousness that they imagine that they hear brass, they hear trumpets and saxophones when it's a very, very rare film that actually has them. Like On Dangerous Ground, Bernard Herrmann did a whole percussive score for that that's all brass, and it's fantastic. It's one of the best scores ever for a noir film. If you just listen to a Miklos Rocha score, you have a, an immediate sense of the sexuality, the sensuality of the film noir translated into music. It's very, very exciting. In Decoy, made in 1946, the music is a very attractive element. In fact, it is, to me, one of the key elements in the film. It, it immediately tells the audience what's going on. Very clever. Border Incident was, I think, the third movie I ever did. It was that nice, tough film that Anthony Mann directed and John Alton photographed, and it was, uh, it really was a pretty relentless film. And uh, so I was allowed to write a, by, by the standards of those years, a fairly modern sounding score, which I liked doing. And um, it was the first time that I had written uh, anything that I could more or less approve of when I heard it. One of the things I really like about film noir scoring is the amount of silence that one is allowed to leave in the score. I personally think there's way too much music in modern film. We try very much with our craft to make those what we call negative space moments where suddenly everything drops out and there's a big question asked, why, why is it silent? I think it can make it even more powerful and more scary and much more suspenseful. I think from my own experience having edited uh, a film like Body Heat, I was an admirer of film noir but really didn't understand how to use the language until I started working in it. And I think one of the things that we can exploit tremendously in modern day film is the range of sound that we have to create a third dimension on the film. They were used very sparingly in film noir and primarily because they didn't have budgets for sound. So the placement of sound within the dialogue became a way of evoking the solitude of a character or his physical state of mind. For instance, in Out of the Past, in the first scenes of this little town, you have a lot of sounds, the distant rails, once in a while a siren going by of a police car, a lot of indicators of the life that he left behind in the city. The idea of the urban environment being somewhat evil and the salutary effects of the rural quiet life. And a lot of these meshings of ideas were actually done in shorthand by use of sound. And you will see this in film noir all the time. The sound effects, that filigree of soundtrack in noir, the brakes of cars, the phones going. It was a revolution in American filmmaking, this style, both in what it said and how it said it. This is noir. Men acting bad, women acting bad, people breaking out of the Hollywood stereotype. And I do think the fun of noir is the bad guy you root for. Chiquita, what are you doing here? Get out. You army men might be accustomed to group showers. I like mine alone. What you really need to make something film noir is the character in the first place. And the film noir character is a gray character. 
That's what's so much fun about film noir is that you have flawed characters and sometimes deeply flawed characters, but as long as they have a code and as long as they're true to themselves, they can really get away with a lot of behavior that in a normal film would immediately peg them as a villain. You make me do it. Why do you make me do it? You know you're going to talk. I'm going to make you talk. Chandler defined it best. He described the film noir hero as a knight in dirty armor. In my own career, I've tried to, to redefine him as a knight in blood caked armor. But he is still a knight. It, he just it doesn't look like one. And he's never rewarded for what he does. He's this lonely character who's out there and he's just bugged by stuff. Most Raymond Chandler derived stories aren't film noir because Philip Marlowe is untouched by the mystery. You will help me, won't you? Is this for love or are you paying me something in money? When the femme fatale, the slut, moves in on him, he turns her down. Yeah, he won't be a part of the emotional tangle. It's almost like his case is a film noir, but he isn't. I don't think you even know which side you're on. I don't know which side anybody's on. I don't even know who's playing today. Whereas a true film noir protagonist is drawn into all that. Look at Out of the Past, which is also a private eye story. But Robert Mitchum's character in that isn't Philip Marlowe. He doesn't stay out. Yeah, He succumbs to the temptation and gets involved with Jane Greer. Do you miss me? No more than I would my eyes. Where should we go tonight? Let's go to my place. And therefore, is dragged into committing morally uh, appalling acts. Philip Marlowe doesn't. He's always irreproachable. The detective figure there, Hercule Poirot, Sherlock Holmes or whatever, they come into a situation, see what's wrong, expose the villain and sort it out and leave. The film noir protagonist sort of never really understands. Yeah, there's a, there is a mystery taking place around them, but they are the victim of it, the subject of it. They don't usually solve it. Buddy, you look like you're in trouble. Why? Because you don't act like it. I think I'm in a frame. Don't sound like you. I don't know. All I can see is the frame. If you've seen enough noir, you start to identify all the traditional characters that are represented. There's always the hard luck loser. There's the schemer. There is the femme fatale. There is the upstanding good girl. There is the sleazy nightclub owner. Uh, who's always the slickest guy in the story and may or may not be shady. You're not always sure. Uh, there's the big capitalist banker, businessman type. I call them the noir apostles. Just politics, baby. Good old dirty politics. The kind of dialogue that popped through film noir, it had nuance and it had cleverness and a lot of humor. If you look at how Channel was adapted. The joint looked like trouble, but that didn't bother me. Nothing bothered me. The two twenties fell nice and snug against my appendix. When Dick Powell, for instance, in, in Murder My Sweet, it was a very nuanced, hilarious fellow. Like, you know, come on, you're a big, tough guy. Do something am am amazing. Pull on your pants. Okay, Marlo, I said to myself, you're a tough guy. You've been sapped twice, choked, beaten silly with a gun, shot in the arm until you're as crazy as a couple of waltzing mice. Now let's see you do something really tough like putting your pants on. It was released as Fellow My Lovely in one theater, I think, in Boston, I'm not sure. And because it had Dick Powell in it, who was known as a singing star, and they thought Fellow My Lovely with Dick Powell was a musical, and nobody, and musicals were out at that time. Nobody wanted to see it. So we changed the title to Murder My Sweet, and they knew that that couldn't be a musical. You still think Anther killed him then? Who else? You? And I tend to think that the acting is a perfect corollary for the writing style. I mean, the, the writers weren't really writing very realistic dialogue. It's not stuff that you're going to hear people utter on the street. You should have told me, Whit. Maybe I would have played it differently. Maybe she wouldn't have heard my shoes squeaking. Always a hop, skip, and a jump ahead of me. And the way the dialogue is delivered is perfectly appropriate to that. You know, like Robert Mitchum. It's just like he's such a natural, and he can take the most flamboyant line of dialogue and just toss it off like nobody's business. I'll give you a ring in about an hour. That'll give you time to find her and get there. Give you a little extra time to figure out how you're going to cross me. But you won't. My very first film was called The Last Tycoon, and I got to play Robert Mitchum's daughter. And I was in the film with Robert De Niro and Jack Nicholson, and there was all these wonderful, famous people in it. But 
who was I wanting to be? I I said, dang, I wish I was older. I wanted to be a notch on Robert Mitchum's belt. You know? so, I mean, that guy was cool. He was just uh, one of the coolest actors I'd ever seen. I absolutely love the acting in these films because many times there's not a lot of dialogue in these films. There are more sort of brooding characters and that are very angst-ridden. More is said by an actor glancing or lighting a cigarette or walking down a street and contemplating the predicament they're in. You just sit and stay inside yourself. You wait for me to talk. I like that. I never found out much listening to myself. <laughs> acting in a film noir. Something that I notice perhaps is that it's slightly over the top in modern standards, but it's perfectly suitable for that particular style. You actually need it to be over the top. It's a little pushed at you. You're not talking about a sack of gumdrops that's going to be smashed. You're talking about a dame's life. Well, I think, first of all, I think it was invented by people like um, Robert Mitchum and Kirk Douglas. I don't think there was such a thing as film noir until those guys actually showed up on screen and had the personas that they had in the movies that they made. Well, the last guy in the world. I hate surprises myself. You want to just shut the door and forget it? No, no, come on in. When I'd see him on screen, I kind of could see that they weren't acting so much as they were being themselves. They were presenting the character through their own personality. They were them in the situation. And that's what clicked in my head. And I realized how simple it really was. And so I tried to approach it from that way. I was just getting ready to take my tie off, wondering whether I should hang myself with it. But not only be rolling in dough, but marrying into this crowd will fix it so as I can... so as I can spit in anybody's eye. In Born to Kill, Lawrence Tierney had a look about him that was really tough, and there was some kind of power that he exuded. It was clearly a negative power. But there was something that came across on the screen and that, that, that clearly was seductive to, to, to women. And in the way that it was written, you could understand that someone would fall for this bad guy, for this outlaw, for this somebody who kind of knows what he wants and will do anything to get it. Your strength, excitement, and depravity. There's a kind of corruptness inside of you, Sam. That would drive most women off if they understood like you do. Yes. But not you. You have guts. Elisha Cook Jr., he was a very good film. You know, he was a terrific film director. Honest, Sam. You go nuts about nothing. Nothing at all. You gotta watch that. You can't just go around killing people whenever the notion strikes you. It's not feasible. Why isn't it? All right, Sam. All right, it is. He was cutting in on me. With her? That was a big worry, I'll bet. He was like the kind of guy people would pick on. <laughs> This will put you in solid with your boss. How's about one for me? There's a very imaginative and clever use of sexuality in the films. Nothing ever gets too explicit or, or too outrageous, but the morality of the films is extraordinarily questionable and daring. I won't let Bernie break your neck. And if I don't, you'll make me talk. You'll squeeze it out of me with those big, strong arms. Won't you? That's right, sister. A lot of times there were downtrodden detectives trying to make good on the trail of some poor guy who got sucked into the femme fatale's web the web of this gorgeous woman who is in fact a criminal. Seems to me that since I've known you, you've become lovelier, more mentally assured. But it also seems to me that when I first knew you, you had a heart. The femme fatale was really born as a result of women taking over so many of the roles of men during World War II. And when men came back, and among all of the other dislocations that they experienced, one was all of a sudden women with this whole new role, women working, women being outside the house. In a lot of ways, film noir was sort of male filmmakers revenge on women for having done that. At the same time, it really represents a lot of mankind's conflicted role with womankind, which is why the femme fatale has her web on the one hand, but is always sort of beautiful and mysterious and sexy and attractive on the other hand. If I should die before I live, that's a nice title, by Philip Marlowe. 
As a result of the war, women were given, I think, some broader characters to play. They didn't have to be quite as cardboard. And that the opportunities for women have improved for the characters. That you can have women who are as tough and as difficult and as ruinous um, as some men have been portrayed. And you're not through. You're in the middle, deep, over your head. No matter what you do now, you're still part of everything that's happened. But it's misleading to think that noir ha has this uh, misogynistic view of women. If you look very closely at these films, they're, they're just chock full of upstanding, forthright women who are going to rescue the poor chump who doesn't know, you know, the hell he's getting into. And uh, I, I just think that that's as revolutionary a thing for these films as their depiction of the evil woman. But maybe it'll teach you not to overplay a good hand. Now she doesn't like you. She hates men. I hate their women too, especially the big league blondes. Beautiful, expensive babes who know what they've got. And inside, blue steel, cold. Cold like that only, not that clean. But a femme fatale is somebody who comes into the office one day with a problem that must somehow be solved by the hero even though he's not dead sure what that problem is and he's pretty sure he's being lied to but it's fun finding out what the problem is what about this day mr crystal ball a dish what kind of a dish 60 cent special cheap flashy strictly poison under the gravy amazing and how do you know all this well she was married to a hoodlum wasn't she what kind of a dame would marry a hood all kinds marie windsor she was a perfect, she was the heroine, the villainess, or whatever it was, a couple of them, because there was a thing about her. There was a thing about some of those actors. They were wonderful. My taste doesn't usually run the cops, but you might not be such dull company at that. The femme fatale is the one in a million kind of woman who has a magical power over men and is utterly and completely evil. You didn't have to kill him. You wouldn't have killed him. He'd have been against us, gone to wit. The part was beautifully written. It's a just terrific role. Jacques Teneur, the director, said to me when I first met him, do you know the word impassive? Impassive. That's what I want. Impassive. No big eyes. Well, it's going to be hard, but okay, I'll try. He said, first half, good girl. Last half, bad girl. Simple. That's what he wanted. That's what I gave him. And it was so easy. You know, you're a curious man. You're going to make every guy you meet a little bit curious. The femme fatale is where women get to be completely the equal of men. They are equally tempted, equally compromised, and equally guilty. And that's kind of a a new thing for Hollywood at this point. I mean, they were very independent women. They knew what they wanted and they knew how to get it. You know, the guy has to pick up a gun, but mm, the woman doesn't need the gun. She knows exactly what weapons she has to wield. You ought to have killed me for what I did a moment ago. There's time. No, you won't. So all these actresses were, of course, dying to play the femme fatale in these movies because they're the most memorable characters. Many of the leading actresses of the era in terms of popularity and compensation were not the ones you would associate with beauty contests. They were paid to portray a certain type of woman. They were paid to look good, but also I think they had to perform in a way that both male and female moviegoers could relate to. It goes from uh, actresses as, as well known as Ava Gardner and Rita Hayworth uh, to obscure wonderful performances like Jean Gilly in a B film called Decoy which is so over the top I mean it's just astounding I'm really happy to see that film kind of being resurrected because it's a jaw dropper <laughs> I don't think we have femme fatales in movies today I think it's one of the things that I think is a big loss because a femme fatale is a woman who makes men go bad and that is very interesting. It always fascinates an audience. It's a unique kind of woman. Shoot, you hear me? All right. Claire Trevor, who's one of my favorite actresses in, in, in film noir, she's, she's in two of my favorite films. She's in Key Largo and, and she's in Born to Kill. I think you've got a secret of some kind, haven't you? 
One of the films that people don't think about very often that's really underrated is Born to Kill, directed by Robert Wise. And Claire Trevor is a terrific actress, and she was terrific in this kind of film. She really gives a very believable performance of someone who stands and says, I can have everything that's easy, I can have everything that's comfortable. And why is it there's something about this darkness, about this unknown, that's magnetic, that's pulling me back? And in the end, believing that she could toy with this and land on her feet, says, as her last words, you know, this time I'm not going to land on my feet. And all these lives are destroyed. Come on out of there! It's me, Sam, remember? Tonight's our night. We still have time for a few kisses before the police get me. The ultimate triumph of the hero against the femme fatale is when she loses her control. When her lies no longer work. Stop, you're killing you! Jerry, stop it! Ah! Barbara Stanwyck, because she was sort of slightly tomboyish and not extremely beautiful, I mean, I wanted to be like Gilda and Rita Hayworth, you know, but I, I that just seemed so unattainable. But Barbara Stanwyck, she just was just a tough cookie, and I just always responded to her. Confidence. I want a man to give me confidence, somebody to fight off the blizzards and the floods, somebody to beat off the world when it tries to swallow you up. <laughs> me and my idea. Are you? Am I what? Glad you're home. Home is where you come when you run out of places. The star of film noir is fate. <laughs> just doesn't get a screen credit. Fate isn't just a character in noir, it's the way the plot works. There's always this idea that, that in a sense, um, the audience is somewhat aware of where things are heading, the way the characters aren't necessarily. But there's always a feeling, I think, with the best film noir, that things are going to end badly, and I think that fate does hang heavy over the characters. Psychological frailty is fate, and film noir is nothing but psychological frailty. The difference between the, the 30s, early 40s gangster movie, the Jimmy Cagney classic, and the film noir is really generational. If you think about the 30s movies of Edward G. Robinson and Little Caesar, he had no decision. It was not some great moral question that came to mind. He was either going to kill that guy and take over the racket or get killed. Film noir, I know people might not think this, but they're much subtler. There are choices to make, and the key is the choice you make takes you down that road, but it was your decision to get in the car. It's your decision whether or not to go with Barbara Stanwyck and get involved with killing her husband. Your fate is not dictated to you as it is in the 30s and early 40s gangster movie. Your fate is in your hands by your decision, and that's what makes it noir. All these elements come together to create this uh, vortex of doom that we're drawn into. Oh, Dr. Craig, you've come to see Miss Shelby all. No. I've come to take her with me. <gasps> the tombstone of film noir was, uh, and intentionally so, was Touch of Evil. It was like the official end, where it taken all these film noir devices right to their extreme. But the real end of it came with television and the 50s family that television came to glorify. And then at the end of the classic noir era, Law and Order came back in in a very heavy-handed way, not coincidentally coincides with the witch hunt, the communist witch hunt in Hollywood. And they said, look, you can't depict these characters having valid sociological reasons for what they do. They're just crazy. Then Warner Brothers put out White Heat with Jimmy Cagney, and it's just the guy's a psycho. How you doing, Parker? Stop being here. I need some air. Oh, stop it, huh? I'll give it a layer. Any m movement in art comes out of the times in which it's made. So it's interesting, I think, that as it faded off, it was in the 70s that it came back, late 60s and 70s, which I think is sort of because of Vietnam, has got the audience in a mindset where they're into the film noir again. What's the matter, Corporal? I'm all right. Chinatown paid off the promise of all those detective novels, 
all the detective movies based on those novels. Film noir is still, is still hard to do, and it's particularly hard to do in color. A great example of it is Memento, which is the Chris Nolan's film that plays backward. All the films I've made have been strongly influenced by watching these films and, and other thrillers, and I've tried in my films to follow that, that same pattern. I think the best noirs are films that don't try to be. They sort of wake up and find themselves there. Now there are many films that are paying homage to these incredibly wonderful films. Sin City would be one, Usual Suspects would be another, there are many. Doesn't look so good for Mr. Lacey. When film noir shows up, in the, in the popular sense, always is associated with, with a society that's, that's a little more cynical and a little bit more um, paranoid and suspicious. If it's making a rebound now, it might again be because that factor makes people more open to cynicism and makes the people making the movies more interested in exploring that, that part of themselves. Don't you? Don't what? I don't want to die. Neither do I, maybe, but if I have to, I'm going to die last. Young filmmakers, when they're first starting out, before they become encumbered by the things that they think give them freedom, before they have big budgets and before they have long schedules, what they are left with is the tools to make a film noir. And from that, they have the influence of filmmakers like Fritz Lang, John Huston, Michael Curtiz, Orson Welles, who all made these great films. Come on, Bob. Let's finish it the way we started it, on the level.